Frilled dragons are an amazing one-of-a-kind reptile, but what do they like to take care of? Well, today I'm going to talk about how to take care of a frilled dragon, and now it's nothing at all like taking care of a Dilophosaurus. For starters, they like much less Wayne Knight in their diet. Yes, the frilled dragon has no relation to the fictional counterpart from Jurassic Park. Now, there's actually two different types of frilled dragons. The first one is the Indonesian frilled dragon, like Delilah here, and then there's also the Australian frilled dragon. Today, I'm just going to be going over the Indonesian frilled dragon specifically because the Australians are a lot more uncommon in captivity and they're also larger and the care is a bit different. And then my usual two warnings with my care guides. First, don't let this be your only research. Watch other care videos, read other care guides. Try and learn as much as you can about a frilled dragon before you bring one home. They're not exactly a beginner reptile. And then secondly, we are not going to talk about breeding today because I don't breed any of my reptiles. I only have one frilled dragon, so I've never done it, so we're just not going to talk about it. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the frilled dragon. Now, frilled dragons, like I said, there are two different types, and the Australians get larger than the Indonesians. And then also the males get bigger than the females. So being an Indonesian female, Delilah here is actually the smallest of the four kind of possible combinations. And the Indonesians also have a kind of more lighter coloration and more of like a bark patterning, I guess you could say. And even with the males being bigger than the females, you can see right here, Delilah is an adult female frilled dragon, and the males usually only max out at about two feet for the Indonesians and up to three for the Australians. Australians. And frill dragons are famous for that big frill out startle display that they give to predators. Now, Delilah here hasn't really frilled on me in a very, very long time for the most part since she was little, but the only time she'll actually frill at me is when I go to start misting her. And then it's funny because she'll frill at me and then a couple seconds later she'll drink the water. But we'll talk about that more in a later section. Now, I have seen frill dragons for sale at pet stores like Petco, but I don't know if I would trust a pet store frill dragon. I mean, sometimes even their bearded dragons and leopard geckos are kind of dodgy. I don't know how I'd feel about buying a uh, more care intensive animal like this from a pet store. Your best bet if you want one is to get one from a breeder or a vendor at a reptile expo or online. They used to mostly be imported but now there's a lot of breeders working with them in captivity so if you want to find a captive bred one it's fairly easy nowadays. The Indonesian frilled dragons range from one to three or four hundred dollars depending on the age, the size, and the sex. And remember this is just the indie frilled dragons. The Australian ones, good luck. Frilled dragons are arboreal lizards. They need climbing space, they need vertical area. So this rules out a lot of the kind of usual enclosure types I would recommend for lizards like tanks or plastic tubs. For a young frilled dragon, you can make glass work short term if you need it, but they grow very quickly. So you're gonna need to get something soon. I think when I first got Delilah, she was in a 30 gallon tank, but if you are using like a 55 or a 75 gallon tank with a mesh lid, you are going to need to put something over most of that lid like saran wrap or tin foil to help keep the humidity in. With Delilah being such a small female, Email, I keep her in a three foot by three foot by 18 inch glass exoterra. Now this could work for a male like as a temporary grow up enclosure, but for a male you're gonna need something even bigger because remember males can top two feet. So you'll need something probably four foot by four foot by two foot at least. And this is just the Indonesians. Australians get even bigger, so they're gonna need even more space. And I mean with this species, if you can give them more climbing space, they will use it. For keeping a frilled dragon, there's a few different enclosure types that I can think of. The first being wood. Now wood is nice because you can build it however you want and it's very easy to find the materials to do it, but you have to have the know-how and the tools to do it, or you have to buy it from someone. And wood is also very, very heavy. And the biggest kind of detractor with wood, with a frilled dragon, they need very high humidity, and they usually have a lot of substrate. And if you don't seal your wood very, very, very well, that is not going to end well. If there's even one little weak spot that moisture can seep in, and this has happened to me with wooden enclosures that I've built, then the wood just rots like crazy and you're out of very expensive enclosure. So wood isn't really something I would recommend for a frilly. Another option would be PVC enclosures. This is usually what I recommend because they hold humidity very, very well, much better than wood. And it's also going to be much lighter than wood. And you don't have to worry about it rotting or anything like that. The only thing with it is it's very, very expensive because making something with wood is a little bit easier for most people, but PVC is kind of hard to work with. So you're most likely gonna have to buy it from somewhere like Animal Plastics, and that's gonna be very expensive, plus shipping on top of that. But you'll have kind of the peace of mind knowing it's not gonna go bad on you in a couple years or you have 
have to reseal it like you would with wood. The last type I would recommend would be a grow tent. Grow tents are more of a kind of recent trend in reptile keeping and they don't work for everything and they, I wouldn't recommend them for like a big lizard but for a frilled dragon they work perfectly. They hold heat and humidity very very well. They're very easy to find just about on Amazon or wherever in a bunch of different sizes and they're also going to be a lot cheaper than PVC or wooden enclosures. I don't have any of my reptiles in grow tents, so I can't like recommend a specific brand, but it, I'm sure there's a bunch of other videos and websites out there that can recommend stuff if you do the research. Now, grow tents, there's kind of one main detractor that kind of turns off a lot of people from them, and that's limited viewing. They don't have like the big viewing windows that PVC or wooden enclosures and stuff do, but for this animal, that actually kind of works in its favor, because frilled dragons are very kind of shy and secretive and skittish, so having limited viewing might actually make them feel more secure. I should also note, like just about all reptiles, this is a solitary animal. You don't really need to give it a buddy to live with they want to live on their own but if you are dead set on getting like a breeding pair or even a couple females trying to cohab them you're going to need a much bigger enclosure than just for one you're going to need at least double the size and never house two males together and obviously don't try to get two living together if this is your first real dragon make sure you get one and you're good and established with that before you worry about anything else You'll need something that holds humidity, and luckily there's a bunch of great bedding options for tropical reptiles. There's cypress mulch, eco earth, cocoa husks, there's a bunch of things to work with. And what I do, and I think I mentioned this in like every care video I've done, but what I do is a topsoil sand mix. You go to Home Depot or like a hardware store, get plain bags of topsoil and just wash play sand and mix that together. I think I do a ratio of like three or four bags of topsoil to one bag of sand. You mix that together. I found it holds humidity really, really well. Now this is not a burrowing lizard, so you don't have to worry about it holding burrows, but it does do that very well. It also is a good thing to put plants in if you want to put live plants in with your frilled dragon, because I found Delilah for the most part is pretty good about not killing them. You can fairly easily do a bioactive enclosure for this species because it's warm and tropical, which a lot of springtails and isopods like. So I have some in my substrate. I also have a bunch of leaf litter. I have little bits of wood and other little pieces of cork bark and stuff for them to hide under. This is not a good beginner lizard. I would never say get a frilled dragon as your first pet reptile. They have a more moderate skill level. And one of the main reasons for this is they have a much higher heat and humidity requirement than even bearded dragons, geckos, blue tongue skinks. If you look at a lot of online care guides for frilled dragons, just frilled dragons in general. They recommend a basking temperature for 110 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit with a warm side somewhere in like the mid to low 90s all the way up to 100. I find this is too hot for my Indonesian frilled dragon. This might just be my experience, but I think with these just frilled dragon care guys, I think they're lumping the Aussie and the Indonesians together. The Aussies do like it really, really hot, but for the Indonesian, I think they like it a little bit cooler. What I found works best, at least for my frilled dragon, is a basking temperature of right around 100 degrees and a warm side in like the low to mid 90s and she seems much more comfortable and isn't avoiding the warm side as much with this when i had it when i first started and i did try to get what online said the 115 110 she just avoided it like the plague so she seems much kind of more at peace now indonesian frillies don't have to deal with the same type of just unrelenting heat that the aussie mainland frill dragons do in the wild so i just i think with this kind of few degrees cooler temperatures it works much better and like i said delilah bass much more with ease for the cool side it's usually just the mid to high 80 somewhere in like the 86 to 89 degree range and at night they're fine with a temperature drop into the 70s but i would say keep it above like 72 73 try to keep it more in like the mid to high 70s at night these lizards love it tropical i would say during the day try never let the humidity drop below like 50 55 percent now for the little ones you can mist them i would say mist like once or twice a day but not like a super intense one as an adult though i give her probably one heavy misting once a day or every other day because in the wild they're no stranger to heavy rain so it's just dumping a bunch of water on them and they get most of their water from drinking during rain or lapping off leaves and things like that for an adult i would say try to keep the humidity between 60 to 70 percent and obviously just after these big mistings it's going to jump up to about 100 percent for a few hours but that's fine to keep track of the humidity i would get an actual good like recommended brand digital hydrometer don't get like one of those crappy little like stick on ones with a little dial on it because those are crap and they don't work that well anyways and if you're going to spend the money on a hydrometer you might as well get like a good one that's going to work since this is a diurnal arboreal lizard they're very used to basking in high spaces so the easiest way to heat them is just getting a heat lamp whether that's a mercury vapor bulb or just a regular old like incandescent floodlight type now we're going to talk about that more in the next section if you're using a glass up with a mesh lid very easy just take the heat lamp put it right on it and like i said with this one you're going to want to use like saran wrap or tin foil to cover the rest of the lid so humidity doesn't just seep out if you're using like a pvc or a wood enclosure it's going to be a lot harder because you have basically two options you can either buy it or build it with kind of like a custom ordered 
grate installed on the top, like you can see with my monitor lizard here. So you can rest the bulb, rest the heat lamp on top of that, but the lizard can still get the heat. The other option, and like you can see with my blue tongue skink here, is actually just have the socket installed inside the enclosure. Now with frilled dragons, you have to be careful because they can jump, they can climb, and you don't want them burning their belly or anything on that heat lamp. You don't want them being able to contact it. So it's not like with my blue tongue skink where obviously he's not getting up to that lamp. So if you do have one inside, you are gonna need to get some type of like mesh cage to go around the lamps just so they can't touch it. But either way of this works. With a grow tent, again, I'm not a grow tent expert, but you'll either have to cut a hole or they might even come with a hole for you to just kind of hang a heat lamp down inside the enclosure. Now this is nice because you can adjust the height however you need to get the right temperature and UV levels and things. But again, you have to be careful because the frill dragon might jump to it and you don't want to like get them to get burned. The two non-bulb heat sources I usually recommend like for snakes and other lizards and things, under tank heaters and ceramic heat emitters won't really work for this species because A, under tank heater usually only heats the couple inches just above it. So it works best for snakes. Not going to work for an arboreal lizard. And radiant heat panels, you can, you could use one for this, but it's going to need a thermostat so it doesn't just burn constantly. It needs a thermostat if you're going to run it. And also, just with this lizard already being a basking lizard, getting the UV and stuff, heat lamp just works no matter what way you do it works better than a radiant heat panel because radiant heat panel, it's going to be a, basically a big plastic box that just emits heat, but it's not really good at emitting a giant like table-sized three or four foot tall enclosure. So you're probably just best off going with the heat lamp. Yeah. The last option is basically a bulb that just gives off heat, not light. It's called a ceramic heat emitter, and it can work really well, especially as a nighttime heat source. If you're using it as a daytime one, you're gonna need to make sure you get some type of light that gives off UV, because this is a diurnal basking lizard. But the main thing with this is it burns really, really high. You need to make sure that if you are using this, there is absolutely no way for the frill dragon to come in contact with this heat bulb, because it burns so high, and it will definitely hurt your lizard. If you do need a heat source, at night to keep your temps in the high to mid 70s then don't use those like red or black light bulbs that they say reptiles don't pick up on but they do pick up on that light it is it's a waste of money plus those bulbs like blow out super quick they're cheap and crappy so just don't get those bulbs if you do need a nighttime heat source get a radiant heat panel get a ceramic heat emitter, get something else. Don't get one of these like red lights. As I've said multiple times this video, this is a diurnal basking lizard. They need UV light. Now there's two ways to do this. The first is a tube light, which is nice because you can get different lengths and it'll evenly distribute UV. Now there's a few caveats when using it with a frilled dragon because A, it's a very, very tall enclosure and you'll have to make sure that there's actually perches and branches and stuff for him to get there and actually get that UV light. Because if it's, if it's at the bottom of the enclosure, it's not going to get any UV light. And B, it doesn't give off heat. It only gives off UV. So if you're using this, you need to get a separate fixture, separate lamp so that it'll get heat in like an incandescent floodlight or something like that. And then when you're using this and it's basking, you have to make sure that UV light is also somewhere nearby so that it's basking. It'll also get UV light because they're probably going to spend a lot of their time underneath that. Now I should mention with these, you're going to have to swap them out eventually because even though the bulbs won't die, they'll still be giving off light they will stop emitting UV at a certain point. So for the T5s, that'll be about 10 to 12 months. And for the T8s, it's about six months. So you will need to replace these semi-annually or annually to kind of give more and more UV because event, like I said, eventually it's gonna run out. The second option and what I do for most of my lizards is a mercury vapor bulb. It's a special bulb that gives off UV and heat. And this is nice because as they're basking, you know you're there getting those UV rays. And there's a bunch of different wattages. There's a 70 watt, 100 watt, 160. I think there's even a 200 watt. You won't need anything that intense. I think I have a 70 watt for her and it's about 10 inches from her. Now, one thing I should know with the basking spot is, and we're gonna talk more about decor, but you're gonna have vertical branches, you're gonna have horizontal, you're gonna have diagonal. And with the basking spot, I would not recommend using your basking spot as a vertical surface because if you put the heat lamp up here and it's a straight up and down stick that it, or log that it holds onto, all that UV and heat is just getting directed right onto its face and head and frill, which isn't really a good time. So what I do is I have mine on an incline or on a, a slope and I would usually, this is more what I recommend is you either get the perch to do some type of slope or if you can, if you have some way to like manipulate your bulb and you can put the bulb at an angle with a straight vertical spot, that works too. But just 
to avoid straight vertical with the heat lamp directly above it. Just like the two bulbs, you will have to change this bulb out eventually because it will keep giving off light, but it'll stop giving off UV. So with this, it usually stops somewhere in the nine to 12 months range. So usually I just swap them out annually. And with this, you'll have to keep track again of when you put it in, when it's time to take it out because it'll keep giving off light. And for the day night cycle, I have all of my lights in my reptile room on timers, 12 hours on, 12 hours off to keep them and give them that day night cycle that they need. Oh, and also never get those like little $20, $15 cheap coil UVs. They give off no UV. They're, they're a crap item. They should not be sold. Just don't get one. And again, if you need a nighttime heat source, do not use those red or black light bulbs. This will probably be some of the most fun you ever have designing a reptile enclosure if you get a frilled dragon because it's a lot of big vertical space and they need a lot of things in it. Because if you just have empty open air spaces, then you're just wasting space. So they're gonna need a bunch of different sized and textured perches. You can use different driftwood, cork bark, tree branches, thick vague vines, ceramic logs, really whatever you can, frilly can use. You're gonna want them vertical, diagonal, horizontal. With mine, I make an X with two different branches right across the middle. And on the basking side, I have this cork bark that I put over to kind of widen the basking area and give her more of a place to kind of move around and maybe she wants to be higher or lower. And then as you can see, I have a straight cork bark going right up the back. And you're also gonna wanna use fake or live plants in there to help hold humidity. And also you're gonna wanna make sure that they're kind of sturdy because I learned several types of plants don't really work well because she likes to just jump into them or climb into them and things like that. So if you have like delicate little ones that are just gonna rip off, so I had to use something sturdy like pothos is always a good choice, um, snake plants. They don't need like the traditional hides on the ground like those half log hides or the caves and things like that that you'd see with geckos and beardies because this lizard feels most at home and secure when it's high up. So give it a bunch of different branches and perches and stuff. Maybe some they can kind of tuck away behind and that'll work just fine. You're going to want to give your frill dragon a water bowl. Now you can use a bigger one if you want to give more humidity because more water means more humidity, but you don't usually see them drinking out of it. They normally go to the bathroom in it. That's especially what Delilah normally does to it. So you're going to want to change it out a bit more probably than your other lizards you're usually going to have to. And with this, they usually drink from their mistings, but if you're worried about your water quality, whether the misting or the water you're putting in the water bowl. Um, I don't have to because I have tap water so I know it's safe, but if you're worried about it, there's a couple different things you can buy like RepTiSafe and stuff that'll make the water safe for reptiles. But if you want, just get a big cup and just fill it up with water and leave it out overnight and the chlorine will naturally just evaporate up out of the water. So there you go. You have safety chlorinated tap water. But again, that's just my kind of home remedy for it. Frill dragons are primarily insectivores. So you're going to need superworms, crickets, dubia roaches, the kind of usual suspects when dealing with bug eating lizards. I will say Delilah really prefers the dubia roaches. She doesn't even go after the superworms and stuff anymore. It's just the roaches. And with these, obviously keep it size appropriate. Don't go feeding little frilled dragons, giant roaches. You can feed them the occasional pinky mouse. Uh, Delilah will chomp one down, but you don't want to feed it very often, maybe like once a month, I would say. For young to juveniles, you're going to want to feed them every to every other day, as many little appropriate size bugs as they'll eat in like five or so minutes. They will slow down and stop eating when they're full. They won't just keep stuffing their face usually. And for an adult, you're fine feeding two to three days a week. They don't really need to eat every other day. Usually I feed her on Tuesdays and Fridays and she'll eat six to 10 roaches in a single feeding usually, but she will stop because she gets full. When feeding the bugs, you wanna use a good multivitamin one feeding a week and calcium without D3, not with D3, twice a week. And you wanna use without D3 because you've already got a UV bulb. You've got a good one. So they get enough D3 with that. You don't need to worry about calcium with D3. Frilled dragons are not really much of a handling pet. She's being pretty good right now, but normally I don't take her to programs that stresses her out too much. Uh, and right now I'm actually shocked how good she's sitting in my hands, but she might be a little on the cooler end because she's been away from her basking spot. And then also the lights and everything might be kind of freaking her out. So she's gonna sit on my hand, but that's why she's been sitting on this the entire video. Cause normally when I try to hold her, she's gonna keep trying to run and jump out of my hands and get away and things like that. So frill dragons are much more of a look, don't touch pet. If you are dead set on trying to hold your frill dragon, first, when you bring it home, let it get established. Make sure it's eating, make sure it's gaining weight, make sure it's going to the bathroom, all that stuff. Don't try to handle it, I say, for a month or two after you bring it home because these guys, they are prone to getting stressed out very, very quickly. So you just, you wanna make sure it's eating and gaining weight before you try anything else. 
as you go in and do feedings or you do water changes, things like that, it'll kind of get used to the schedule and it might start getting a little bit more calmer in your presence. It'll be like, okay, they're coming in to feed me. They're coming in to just mess with the water. They won't be like darting out and trying to run away from you and stuff. Cause I can open her enclosure, no problem. She knows I'm just gonna feed her cause I don't really mess with her too much. But again, frilled dragons really aren't something you're going to most likely ever be able to hold. If you want, you can try and start trying to guide it onto your arms as they eat. But again, she just eats on her perch. She like will never eat anywhere else, but you're welcome to try that. If you are gonna try and handle it, just do it inside its enclosure at first. Maybe it'll feel more secure in a space that it already knows. Just kind of get it in your hands, let it walk between your hands, maybe let it walk onto its perch, things like that. She's never bit me. She's never even furled at me when I've gone in to handle it. Like I said, she usually just furls at me when I missed. So I don't have to worry about her biting me, but if you have a really big male, I've heard some nasty stories of adult frilled dragons biting and these guys have some really sharp teeth so if you are worried about it use gloves the main thing with her is she's got really sharp claws so those can hurt a good bit when she's kind of shuffling through my hands but if you're worried about it use gloves so that was our care video on the frilled dragon if you found it useful maybe like the video that would help out a lot or subscribe because i post animal videos every week thank you to our amazing patrons for supporting the channel it means a lot to me thanks for tuning in and i'll catch you later